This is the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. This program contains, once again, a very important message. And this message has to deal with the fact that people who call themselves born-again Christians, people who claim to be Bible-believing Christians, are extremely vulnerable and being highly exploited through social media, through the internet, through mainstream media, and perhaps most importantly at this current moment, Christians, Bible-believing Christians, authentic conservatives, all are being exploited and taken advantage of in very egregious ways through disinformation campaigns and manufactured fake news. But it's not fake news um, like when Donald Trump says it. You know, Donald Trump will point to a mainstream media news network uh, like CNN and call them fake news, or I think he said one time as a joke, you're faker than fake news. This is not an expose of that because Most people, most thinking people, already know that the mainstream media is predominantly fake news in in a number of ways. And and that includes the so-called conservative, liberal, moderate, whatever you want to call it, cable news network. Of which, by the way, I'm thankful the fact that it exists, because without that one network, there would be no conservative, moderate position whatsoever, because all the other cable news networks are not liberal. They're berserk. They're, they're, they're psychotic. And I say this coming from having grown up in a liberal leftist household in New York City, raised as an atheist, taught to believe in all the liberal point of view. And I grew up in an environment when I got into my teens and even before that, where um, the left and liberals were known for, they were known for, they were synonymous with being truly tolerant, truly diverse, and most of all, the authentic left, the authentic radical left, liberals, they didn't call themselves progressives back then, they all were the champions of free speech. They were the militant champions of free speech. And so in one sense, you had to give them a great deal of credit because they believed the left, going back decades ago, once upon a time in America, believed that um, you needed to defend anyone's right to free speech, even if you totally disagreed with it. And back then, unlike today, organizations like the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, would defend not only liberals and progressives and leftists, but they would uh, routinely defend conservatives and others, hyper-conservatives, uh, because they believed in the right to free speech above all else, uh, even if they disagree. So the entire nation was brainwashed by the left through the media since going way back to my early childhood. And it, and it stemmed from the McCarthy era. Uh, era where Senator Joseph McCarthy, uh, the left claimed, went on a witch hunt with a a series of national investigations into the lives of powerful politicians, powerful, influential people in the entertainment industry, writers, directors, studio heads, actors, actresses, musicians, uh, writers, 
you know, a who's who of, of leadership, cultural leadership, political leadership, entertainment leadership, financial leadership in our nation. They were, I, I shouldn't say they were all under investigation, but um, Senator Joseph McCarthy and Hoover, who headed up the FBI, and back then the FBI was a totally different institution. Under J. Edgar Hoover, the FBI, none of this nonsense that's going on with the FBI today uh, would have happened if J. Edgar Hoover, the director of the FBI, was still around. He would have cleaned house instantly. So McCarthy, according to the left, went on a witch hunt. And anybody who had communist beliefs or they suspected of having uh, uh, inserted communist beliefs in their speeches, speeches, their movies, their acting, their lifestyle, and their politics or whatever, was called into a series of investigations. And I'm not paraphrasing it exactly, but the, there were, there were, this was done by several different fronts in our government. One was uh, the House of Un-American Activities. And they would ask questions to prominent movie stars and directors, etc. Have you now or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? That was the famous opening line. Have you now or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? And it was an inquisition. Um, and it was an inquisition born of the real fear, by the way, that communists, communist spies, communist sympathizers, communist agents had infiltrated all levels of American society and were attempting to uh, maneuver a cultural revolution, or maybe worse, here in the United States of America. Now, I don't subscribe to inquisitions, and the problem with inquisition-style hearings is that it incites a feeding frenzy uh, mentality like sharks in a shark tank. And in the emotionalism and the witch hunt atmosphere or the communist witch hunt atmosphere, it wasn't that there wasn't a legitimate concern regarding communist infiltration in our culture because there were people in the entertainment industry who were communists and uh, were using their films, etc., to promote communist ideas. There were people at all levels of our society who were communists, and they were using their influence and power to promote communism. But the hearings went way overboard, and when they became, when they got out of control, as all these hearings, whether they're hearings being held by the right or the left, because the left has been guilty of similar things, it turns into a witch hunt, it becomes hysterical, and then is a lot of innocent people get improperly accused. A lot of innocent people uh, end up going to jail, losing their jobs, and having their careers destroyed through a false accusation of being a communist when in fact they were not. And that did happen. And so is not something that I look at as a positive thing. But I do think there was a reason for it. That, now, that doesn't justify the fact that it got out of control, but there was a reason for it. For example, there was a married couple, I believe it was the Zimbergs. I'm searching way back in my memory. And from earliest childhood, I remember that the Rosenbergs were uh, suspected of being uh, spies for communist Russia and that they had stolen and smuggled into Russia uh, U.S. nuclear secrets on like how to make a nuclear bomb, something to that effect. And I remember that the New York Times, which we read <clears throat> as a family constantly and all the liberal media, continually defended the Rosenberg saints I remember my family members, you know, passionately saying the Rosenbergs were uh, innocent, and I believe they were innocent because of the culture around me. And so it was considered a moral outrage 
and it was considered an abuse of power to to say that the uh, Rosenbergs were guilty as the government had decided of spying for communist Russia. Um, the, the liberal point of view was this was an outrage, it was a complete falsehood. And they were kind of brought up as an example of how innocent people's lives got destroyed. But you know what? Decades and decades, when I grew older and decades had passed, mysteriously, out of the blue, real evidence surfaced, which did in fact prove that the Rosenbergs were uh, actual communist spies and had spied on our nuclear program and had given <clears throat> nuclear secrets to the Russians. So despite the fact that all this liberal public sympathy for the Rosenbergs as being innocent victims, after a number of decades had passed by, it turns out that they were communist spies. And so, you know, despite the fact that there was a witch hunt mentality, the reality was that there were people in high places who were, in fact, not just communist sympathizers, they were communist spies and communist agents. Another man, Algor Hiss, who occupied extremely high positions <clears throat> with of the United States and in Washington, D.C. He was suspected of being a communist spy or a Russian agent. But once again, uh, for basically his entire life, those accusations were, were denounced as totally false by the liberal media. New York Times, etc. And so the very notion that Alger Hiss, this powerful politician, he was so powerful that he's in the picture uh, with Winston Churchill and uh, the American president um, in this famous photograph with these world leaders. And uh, there's Alger Hiss. And Alger Hiss also was uh, perhaps the most important U.S. leader in the bringing about of the United Nations. Alger Hiss was uh, perhaps the most important, the most powerful, influential leader who brought into existence the United Nations. So all the accusations of Alger Hiss being a communist were denounced, just like it was the Rosenbergs. Once again, mysteriously, as the decades passed, a long time had passed, evidence was discovered that Alger Hiss was indeed a communist agent working for communist Russia. And his uh, input into the... Uh, war resolutions that, that ended after World War I and his input in the founding of the United Nations was not just pragmatic or logical input. It, would, it was all based on how it would help further the spread of communism on a global level. So despite that McCarthy and the House of uh, Un-American Activities, et cetera, went uh, somewhat crazy in certain areas. They weren't totally off the wall uh, in, in their suspicions because the reality was this stuff uh, was really going on. Now, the point is, back then, the left championed free speech. In fact, if you go back to the early 1960s, there was a radical activist at the University of Berkeley Mario Savio, who was the head of an actual group. It was like a group like Black Lives Matter is today, or Occupy Wall Street is today. He founded a group called the Free Speech Movement. Free Speech Movement. And they protested on college campuses and everywhere, and their basic message was, is that 
everyone has the right to free speech, whether you like it or not. So if you want to talk about communism in a positive way, you have the right to do so. If you want to talk about conservatism in a positive way or the Constitution in a positive way, you have the right to do so. And basically, he was making his appeal based on the Bill of Rights, which just talks about freedom of speech and freedom of the press. So the left, everywhere you turned, there were all these uh, cases of uh, books and novels and films, etc., that were uh, attempting to be censored. And usually the, the focus of the area of censorship had to do with uh, graphic sexual language or photographs or whatever. Now, when we say graphic, it's like absolutely nothing compared to today what's considered normal. So graphic back then would probably be PG-13 rated or PG rated. Um, But there were all these lawsuits that went to the Supreme Court with best-selling novelists like Norman Mailer and others uh, over the graphic content that was in their novels, etc., which again, by today's standards, would not even be a, would be nothing. But the left championed their right um, to exercise their free speech. And their whole point was that if you start to erode free speech in one area, you're going to end up eroding it and taking it away in all areas. Therefore, we're going to maintain the position that everybody has the right to say whatever they want to say, unless it's a call for you know somebody's murder or destruction. And you know, it was a movement designed to protect free speech. So at every hand, the left, the liberals, were the defenders of free speech militantly. Now, as the decades passed, many decades passed, and it's been in the last 10 years, well, actually prior to that, as soon as the political correctness movement began to uh, rise on the college campuses, and let's remember that the political correctness movement didn't, didn't rise spontaneously. The political correctness movement was a deliberately mapped out, planned strategy to create a cultural communist revolution in America. It was a game, the, the political correctness movement was a game plan developed by the Frankfurt School university professors who were Marxists in Frankfurt in the 1920s. These same Frankfurt professors were trained by the Russian secret police, the KGB, in Moscow, and they had their university in Moscow, and then they moved to Frankfurt, Germany, and set up the Frankfurt School in the 1920s. And they spawned many intellectuals and writers, several generations of them, And they codified this concept of free speech. And free speech really is a mechanism of mind control, and it's a mechanism of propaganda. So now on the college campuses and in our society, you have more censorship and less free speech than ever before. Because anything that is not officially politically correct, according to the dogma, of the high priests of political correctness, which originated with the Frankfurt School of Marxists in the 1920s, is considered illegal, and they want people arrested, fined, thrown in jail, thrown out of society, their books burned or whatever, all in the name of that what people are saying is not politically correct, And, of course, political correctness is all aligned for the promotion of a kind of Marxist, leftist, socialist worldview. And they have indoctrinated many generations of high school students and uh, college students into this political correct mindset. But, you see, that whole thing is the total opposite. It's 180 degrees opposite of the Berkeley free speech movement where the left defended free speech. Now the left and progressives, or socialists, or whatever they call themselves, are the most militant censors 
of free speech. They are the attackers of free speech. They're the ones, you see, everybody was programmed through Hollywood, through television, through films, through books, and knowledge, uh, not knowledge, through books, films, television, uh, and other forms of communication, and on the um, college campuses, the mantra was that if censorship was ever to come, that it would come from uh, fundamentalists, born-again Christians, or the right, strong consists the right, and especially fundamentalist Christians, that Christians and, and right-wingers and conservatives would be the censors. They would be the book burners. They would be the ones. That was definitely going to be the group that, in a Hitlerian way, was going to burn the books, uh, restrict what movies, uh, dominate what you could do in Hollywood or anywhere else. And it was said over and over and over again in a million different ways that the conservative right wing fundamentalist evangelical Christians were the greatest threat to our society because they were like budding Nazis and they were going to burn and uh, bring in some kind of totalitarian government which would totally restrict free speech. So there's so many movies out, so many television shows out, so many novels written. So many speeches by radical leftists going back to the 80s, 70s, 60s, and 50s that, that repeat this theme that censorship is going to come from the radical right, from fundamentalist Christians, evangelical Christians, and they're the censors, and they're the book burners, and they're the greatest threat to freedom in our society. And every belie- everybody believed it. It was even believed by people who were on the right or conservatives and Christians. Everybody was brainwashed into believing that Christians would be the greatest threat. Well, as time passed by, um, as the decades moved by, that, ter- that mantra, that false belief that the threat to liberty was going to come from conservative Christians, etc., turned out to be totally false. It turned out to be a total lie. Because today, and over the past 20 years or more, there has to been little or no threat whatsoever coming from conservatives, right-wingers, evangelical Christians, what's left of fundamentalist Christians, There is no threat whatsoever that the right, that conservatives, that Christians would be a danger to society and attempt to take away people's freedoms in regards to free speech, in relationship to freedom of the press, uh, and that Christians would be a threat in burning books and everything else. I mean, you had the sporadic episodes of idiocy, like when a bunch of uh, not-too-bright people who are Christians burned the Beatles albums, you know, but that was like one aberration. The reality is there was and is no threat from the right conservatives or Christians regarding censorship. In fact, the exact opposite happened. The most militant, virulent, hating form of censorship, book burning, restricting of your free speech, restricting of your belief systems, all comes from the left. It comes from liberals. It comes from progressives and socialists. And it comes through the campuses and the political correct movement. And what that movement has become, see, most of the people in the movement have no idea what it's become because they're completely ignorant and clueless about the history of their own movement. I mean, we're talking about a blank, empty space in their brain. They have no idea what the origins of their movement was 30, 40 years ago. I know because I've debated these people. And uh, 
I was a radical leftist. I was in the anti-war movement. I was made an honorary member of the Black Panther Party. I was involved in uh, the first Earth Day planning sessions. So I was part of the radical left. And I knew, not all of them, but I worked with some of them personally, the leaders of the radical left. Now, when I bring up the name of the, re- the leaders of the radical left, whether it's the leaders of the Black Panther Party or leaders of the environmental movement or the leaders of the progressive movement or whatever, people today of all age groups, not just millennials, people in their 30s and 40s, have no idea who I'm talking about. I was debating this one girl about the... Uh, rights of African Americans, and she was, uh, I was debating her on uh, Fox News Network, and I brought up the fact that I was made an honorary member of the Black Panther Party, and she tried to scoff it off, and then I began to question her about the history of uh, the Black Panther movement, and she had no idea whatsoever. She'd never even heard of the leaders of the original Black Panther movement. And that's not just her. She looked rather idiotic. It's not just her. It's an entire generation. They have no sense of history. They have no concept of the fact that the original liberals, leftists, progressives, and socialists all believed in freedom of speech, and they were not into censorship. But today, they have become, for all practical purposes, Fascists. So, so we were told that the fascism, that the, the Nazi movement that was going to rise in America would emerge from Christians and conservative Christians and conservatives, etc., that this was going to be some kind of neo-Nazi movement censoring everything. But that all turned out to be a total lie, a total lie, because um, that never happened. The group that became the most militant, angry censors, the group that has become fascist in nature. So if you attempt to exercise your right to free speech on a college campus or in a university or on television demonstration or anywhere, if you don't speak, <clears throat> you know, the official politically correct dogma, you will be attacked. Uh, you could be physically assaulted. Uh, you, worse, you know, you, people will, will, will seek to physically harm you. They will censor you. They will throw you off campus. And they will behave like uh, the Nazi youth. They're militant. They're crazy. And they're fascist. They behave like fascists. Fa- fascists use physical, raw, brute force to get their way. And so it's speaking this politically correct mumbo jumbo that they've made up. They attack you, they go after you. And so they they have become the fascists, but they but unlike the original left, which was somewhat intelligent, they don't have the intelligence, the education or knowledge to know the history of their own movement and how their own movement used to be uh totally against censorship and totally for free speech. So that's where we are now. We have a great danger in our society. And the great danger in our society is that the left and the progressive groups have become fascist. They've become militant. They've become angry. They've become full of rage. And in their militancy, rage, and fascism, they justify violence. And personally, I think their potential of, uh, personally, I potentially think they're capable of all kinds of things because they have a fascist, Nazi like mentality. But it didn't come like we were told it was going to come. It came from the left, not from the right. And that's where we are now. When you see the anger in the eyes of some of the politicians who would describe us as progressives, the anger in the students, the anger in the activist groups. You should be very concerned because if you look in their eyes, you see pure, unadulterated hatred. I mean, their eyes are burning with hatred. 
That's the same hatred that exists in any uh, destructive movement like the Nazis. It's organized. It harnesses energy based on hatred. The Women's March uh, last year, the women who participated in the Women's March, whatever they had to say was nullified by the fact that their eyes burned with this psychotic hatred, which which boiled over into kind of an insanity in their speech and an insanity in their behavior and actions. This is very dangerous. Now, the, the point is, this could have originated from the right. It could have originated from conservatives and Christians. I mean, the human heart is desperately wicked, whether you're a conservative or whether you're a progressive. But in this particular case, in this particular time period, the danger of militancy, the danger of hyperfascism, based on an objective analysis, is totally from the left and the progressives. You look into the eyes of their spokespeople, the politicians that support them, and the unifying factor is their eyes burn with hatred. They're irrational. They are extremely dishonest. They warp and twist the truth, just like the Nazi youth. And as such, they're dangerous. Because, you see, given the right set of circumstances uh, and the right opportunities, when people allow that level of toxic hatred to boil over in their hearts, um, they, they lose their moral compass. They, they lose control over themselves. And when they lose control over themselves and allow their hatred to boil over, they are capable of anything. Just like an abuser in a household who goes ballistic and psychotic and beats his wife and children. There, there comes a, the anger begins to boil and then something snaps in the guy's brain and he becomes physically abusive to his wife and children. There's a moment where a, a switch is flipped and he goes berserk. He's out of control and he can become very dangerous. Well, that can happen in movements. Now, you add to that, you have to add to that a very important historical and scientific fact. If you you do not understand this historical and scientific fact, you're not going to be prepared for what is coming. You're going to be a soft target, you're going to be vulnerable, and you're going to be at great risk because you don't have a firm grasp on what's happening. So in a moment, we're going to come back and talk about precisely what is happening on a deeper level and why you need to know about it so that you can be proactive. You're listening to the Paul McGuire Report on McGuire. Visit paulmcguire.us. That's paulmcguire.us. This is the Paul McGuire Report on Paul McGuire. Okay, so here's the truth that you need to know. And by the way, I think it's important, vitally important, for you to spread this truth far and wide around the censorship system so that people you know who are hungry for knowledge and are open to the become educated about what I'm about to talk about so that they can overcome, survive, and protect themselves. Because what I'm about to explain to you is not some hypothetical situation. It's based on historical fact. So, we have the progressive movement, socialist movement, with different branches. They have been organized behind the scenes. They have been financed 
What makes them dangerous is not the fact that they're just organizing among themselves. What you have to understand is that they are being organized strategically by super wealthy billionaires, globalists, who have a very dark hidden agenda. So, you know, given if it was just up to them, um, they would fade away quickly. But they're being propped up, they're being financed. Professional organizers, professional promoters are um, empowering them and financing them to accomplish things that they could never do by themselves. And this money is coming from some pretty big super billionaires who represent the globalists because the globalists have a vested interest in toppling a nationalist, patriotic, Judeo-Christian <clears throat> America. So you have to understand that. You see, if you're calculating what could possibly happen, happen you must um, add into the equation the fact that these groups are, re- are receiving organization, manpower, technical know-how, endless cash flow, by very, very powerful people. So that changes the whole dynamic. Now, number two is you have to understand that throughout history, and especially throughout recent history, the last 150 years, okay, you have to understand that in the world, there have been an entire series of social political situations in a vast spectrum of nations that have been very similar to what we're experiencing here in America. In fact, it goes back way past 150 years. It goes back to the French Revolution, which occurred in the late 1700s. And here is the dynamic. Well, there's actually a couple of dynamics. The first dynamic is is that you have to understand that most often the majority of the people who are involved in these radical social movements, in this case I'm talking about the progressive movement or the socialist movement, various millennial movements, that chances are the majority of people in those movements Um, think they are doing a good thing. They think they're bringing about social justice. And most likely, the majority of people in those movements um, have good hearts to one degree or another. They truly want to do something positive to change our nation and world for the better. So they think that they're acting on behalf of the forces of good, the forces of righteousness, and and the force of love. They really believe that. Here is the problem. Here is the problem. It's not a mythological problem. It's a problem that's repeated itself in history. Now, of course, the people involved in these movements have been deprived of any opportunity to know real history because they've been sent to mind control factories called the public education system or the educational system, where they've been scientifically dumbed down and they have no understanding whatsoever of historical facts. So they can't compare or contrast the current social movement with any other social movement or any other thing, because they've been programmed to be stupid. And that's not an insult, it's true. By the elite, by the way. When you review similar times of social discontent and people organizing and creating a mass movement and uh, attempting to radicalize others to join in a mass movement, let's call it a revolutionary movement of whatever kind. Usually, at the beginning of all these movements, whether it was the National Socialist Movement of Adolf Hitler, whether it was the Bolshevik Bolshevik Movement or the Communist Movement in Russia, 
whether it was the uh, communist Chinese revolutionary movement or the revolutionary movement in Cuba or North Vietnam or socialist movements in various nations. <clears throat> and the tremendous sympathies by American artists, intellectuals, writers, filmmakers, actors, directors, media people, the tremendous sympathy they had, an irrational sympathy for communism and socialism. It was irrational because they had romantic, utopian beliefs about these revolutionary causes. So here's your problem. It's an historical problem. It repeats itself. The historical problem is always this. In all of these movements, <clears throat> again, the vast majority of people usually have good parts. They're usually optimistic. They usually don't want to do evil. And they truly think they're bringing about something good and positive in terms of social justice, and etc. That is a repeated fact over and over again. But there's also a series of repeated facts over and over again that if you know history, which they don't because the mainstream media won't give them any history, the mainstream media is there for the purpose of reinforcing the dumbed-down state of lower consciousness that Americans have been programmed into since uh, grammar school, high school, and college and universities. The mainstream media is, is, is created for the purpose of indoctrination and for dumbing down the people. It offers no education or insight whatsoever. Okay, so what happens over and over again is that in these movements, it attracts, especially among the young people, it attracts what we call idealists who believe the very best about these revolutionary movements like socialism, like communism, like liberalism, like Marxism, like national socialism, like progressivism, or whatever it is. It attracts Historically, in every place this has occurred, it attracts people who are idealists, who are optimistic about it. It attracts romanticists, people who have a romantic uh, uh, viewpoint of the whole thing. They look at this progressive movement through rose-colored glasses. They think it's going to bring about utopia or heaven on earth. You see, it attracts idealists. It attracts, and, and idealists are often creative people. So it attracts a lot of artists, actors, directors, novelists. It attracts a certain amount of political people, a certain amount of financial people who all are looking at these social press movements through rose colored glasses, a false optimism, and they're looking at these movements. Um, with um, uh, a non-rational idealistic viewpoint. It's non-rational because they're deliberately and systematically choosing to ignore all the warning signs and all the facts along the way that clearly say, warning, danger ahead, radioactive material. See, those signs are up there. The signposts are up there as you watch the behavior of these groups period of time. But because there's a psychological energy released, people are utopian, they're looking at it through rosy colored glasses, they're overly idealistic, so they're not looking at it through the lens of history and rational, logical minds. Now, that's just not me, Paul McGuire, saying that. That is an historical reality. Okay, and let me prove it to you. In fact, the very heads of the communist revolution, people like Lenin and Stalin and others, okay, these were the hardcore revolutionaries who organized the, some of the bloodiest revolutions in human history where millions were killed, sent to concentration camps, raped, slaughtered, 
sent to psychiatric hospitals if they had different political beliefs. The blood of millions were, were spilt on the ground. People worked for less than slave labor rate, wages. All their rights were taken away. And you take all these communist revolutions together, this is not, this is not you know, a number. You're talking about approximately 240 million people who died, were deliberately starved to death, killed, slaughtered, or sent to ed- uh, concentration camps because of these communist revolutions. 240 million people died or were killed or tortured. There's nothing like that in the hum- human history, by the way. So how could that be when all these revolutions began with idealism and rose-colored glasses? That's the problem, you see. So the communist revolutionary leaders themselves, the guys who ordered the mass killings, the guys who knew what were really going on, they would call all the people who followed and became part of their communist revolution or their Marxist revolution or their socialism, a socialist revolution. These hardcore communist leaders, this is what they would call them, to their face, by the way. And this is what they called all the American intellectuals and artists and novelists and writers and screenplay directors and actors. They called them. The communist leaders like Lenin and Stalin called them useful idiots. They said openly and in their writing, these are the useful idiots. Okay, so we have to really understand that. Because we have people today following the model of socialism, communism in their social movements. If the founders of the communist revolution were alive today, like Lenin and Stalin, etc., They would call all these millennials, all these college students, all these media people, all these cultural spokespeople like Michael Moore and others. They would the communist leaders would define them as useful idiots. Why? Because the communist leaders understood very soberly precisely what the purpose of a socialist communist revolution was. They didn't look at it through rose-colored glasses. They understood exactly what it was. And so they understood that in order to seduce the people, in order to get the people to enroll in this revolutionary movement called communism or socialism, They would have to paint a very lying but rosy picture of what the revolution was going to be like. And so they talked in these pious platitudes about how we're going to achieve social justice, how we're going to redistribute all the wealth fairly, how we're going to create a worker's paradise, how we're going to create utopia on earth, how we're going to have a perfect state created where everybody has an equal say-so in everything. And there will be no rich and no poor. We're going to guarantee health care. We're going to guarantee education. We're going to guarantee employment. You're going to live in a perfect society. There won't be any capitalist rich pigs oppressing you. Blah, 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 blah. All right. That's how that was the sales pitch by the communist leaders. They did it through propaganda. So that would tickle the ears of all the idealists. All the Hollywood people, all the intellectuals, all the college students, their ears were tickled. And so they would become diehard communists and socialists. They would join the revolution because this is what they were told the revolution would be. But you see, all these people who were idealists and joined the revolution did not bother to really read and study the facts about communism what communism's and socialism's real game plan was, and what the end game or what the real agenda was. They didn't even bother to read uh, the disclaimer on, on the revolutionary statements. So that's why the leaders of the communist revolution always referred to them as the useful idiots. They would exploit these idealists. They recognized they were idiots. And they would exploit them to begin the revolution, to begin by mass demonstrations, to begin 
as they, they would incrementally, uh, they'd start them with peaceful things like peaceful protests and holding up banners and organizing unions and stealing food and redistributing redistributing food. So the communist leaders were very clever. They, they, they got these idealists involved in all these positive, peaceful activities that, you know, seemed all good and utopian, which jazzed all the naive, idealistic people. But then slowly, incrementally, they would bring them deeper and deeper into the truth of what the real communism, socialist, Marxist movement was about. But you see, they would use the technique of propaganda and mind control, like a frog boiling itself to death in water. The old adage that if you put a frog in boiling hot water, it'll jump out immediately. But if you put a frog in a pot of water, which is lukewarm, and you slowly turn up the heat, it will stay in there as it becomes accustomed to the water getting hotter and hotter, and it will die from the heat of the hot water, and it won't attempt to escape. Escape, because it's incrementally temperature of the water slowly has been brought to a boil. Well, the communist radical revolutionaries use this same strategy. So first it was just peaceful and idealistic things, and the next thing you know, guns are being passed out, and you're training people to shoot and kill. Next thing is uh, you're they're they're being enrolled not in peaceful protests; they're being mobilized in armed revolutions where they're robbing capitalist banks, breaking into the homes of people looting and pillaging and raping, okay? Then they're organizing them into armies, and they're, they're now they're brainwashing the people through mind control to justify breaking all moral codes of right and wrong, and they're bringing them systematically <clears throat> to be communist revolutionaries by teaching them the darker part of the communist manifesto, which is by any means necessary. Any lie, any act of cruelty, any violence, anything, no matter how horrific, is totally justified in order to accomplish the communist revolution. So the communist revolution, by its very nature, is immoral and amoral, because the, because the operating principle is by any means necessary. You are totally allowed to commit crime, moral or otherwise, in order to create a communist revolution. Um, And it's justified because you're doing it for the people. You're doing it to create this perfect new society. So in the mind control process, in the brain control process, you, you get people to think, you program people to think with irrational inconsistencies. And then you start to get them desensitized, and now they're willing to commit acts of cruelty and violence and bombs and all kinds of other things. It starts out all peaceful, all intellectual, singing songs around the campfire, singing Kumbaya. That's how it always starts. Now, don't think for a moment that here in the United States and in Europe, we are not and in many other nations, that we're not in the initial stages of a revolutionary movement, because we are not in the initial stages. We're, we're farther into it until you, realize, until you realize. But unless you're educated, self-educated, unless you've developed the notion awareness to understand what is going on, you're going to be victimized by it. Your family's going to be victimized by it. And the number one thing that is going to create the greatest harm, the greatest evil, and the greatest devastation is this. As long as people cling to this pervasive false belief that it can happen here, as long as good people, conservative people, Christian people, cling to this mythology that There's no way anybody could become that evil, that violent, 
that cruel. Essentially, as long as they follow in the pattern of the Jews, who kept saying it can't, it can't happen here, while Hitler was seeking, seeking, secretly arresting all the Jews and putting them into concentration camps and killing them, the Jews were ignoring the evidence and, and brainwashing them by, by themselves by saying it can't happen here. As long as you, you see what you're really doing is you're denying biblical truth. Biblical truth says that all the hearts of all men and women are desperately wicked and that all men and women have own human nature and are sinners. Now, if you really believe what God's Word said, if you really believe the Word of God, that the hearts of men and women are desperately wicked, what does that mean? It means that there is no sin and there's no evil under the sun that fallen men and women are not capable of committing. They're capable of committing anything, no matter how horrible, evil, thick, twisted, sadistic. They're fully capable, not capable, they're fully capable of doing it. In fact, they're programmed to do it by their sin nature. For the hearts of men and women are desperately wicked. We have a fallen human nature. And apart from Jesus Christ, unless that human nature of wickedness and sin is crucified, that is who we are at the core of our beings. Now, because Christians chaff and rebel against the Word of God and and embrace this completely unbiblical idea and doctrine that is pervasive uh, and spread, being spread throughout all the Christian churches and ministries right now. And it's a doctrine of demons. That what is being taught essentially in most churches through most ministries is that all men and women are basically loving, kind, and good. And given the right set of opportunities or the right set of economic environment, they would be good, decent, loving people. That is not a biblical concept. That is a concept that comes deeply out of communism, Marxism, and socialism. The ideas of communism, Marxism, and socialism are diametrically opposed to the teachings of the Bible. The doctrines of humanism, Marxism, and socialism say that man is basically good, kind, loving, and decent, and that it's his environment, whether it's economic environment or some other environmental reason, which causes men and women to become evil and murderers and violent and things like that. But that's a lie. That's an all-pervasive lie promoted by humanists, communists, socialists, that man is basically good. And all we have to do is tinker with his or her environment, usually economically, by redistributing the wealth, and all people will be good. Now, the problem with that is that is a principle, that is a satanic principle, that comes directly from Karl Marx, socialism, secular humanism, and communism. And it's a lie. It's a lie. Anyone who raised children knows that children are born selfish. Anybody who's lived knows that people are basically narcissistic and selfish. Admittedly, they hide the darker parts of their personalities. But all you got to do is turn on the news to see manifestations of the darker parts of people's human personalities. Now, conversely, the Bible says that ever since Adam and Eve, all men and women are sinners. They have a fallen human nature. And that their hearts are not just wicked. They're desperate. So, If it's true, which it is, that in your fallen human nature, your heart or your inner man or woman is desperately wicked, 
what, what do you think it means that your inner man or woman is desperately wicked? What do you think the word desperately wicked means? It means it's not only wicked, but it's desperately wicked. So what would be a description of the actions, behaviors, and thoughts that would flow out of a man or woman whose hearts are desperately wicked? Well, I'll, I'll save you the math. Murder, violence, sadism, cruelty, unspeakable selfishness, human sex trafficking, pedophilia, child sex trafficking, killing millions of people with biological warfare and nuclear bombs, robbing and stealing from people, starving people to death. I mean, the list of human horrors could go on and on and on. And here's the thing. Because the human heart is desperately wicked, one of the manifestations of the sinful nature of the human heart is it deceives. Part of the product of sin is that sin deceives the sinner into believing that, oh, you're not so bad deep, deep inside. That you're, you're basically loving and good. See, part of the dynamics of having a fallen human nature is that spiritual deception comes upon you, and you're incapable of seeing honestly through the light of Christ just how wicked and depraved and sinful you are in the core of your fallen human nature. Now, they don't like to talk about that in churches. If you were to preach that in a church I have, I'm telling you right now, you'll have people in the choir squirming and screaming. You'll have people in the congregation squirming and screaming. You'll have the pastoral staff, if they can control themselves, extremely uncomfortable if they don't pull the mic on you. And I'm just going to flat out tell you the truth. You'll begin to see demonic manifestations in the church, in people. Now, I'm not saying that true born-again Christians have demons. I'm not saying that. But you see, all the people that are, are in the church who fooled everybody that they're born again, but they're not truly born again, and have this fallen human nature that's desperately wicked, when they hear the power and convicting truth of what I just shared to you, they can't stand it. And, and the demonic entities that uh, oppress them through uh, demonic external forces called demonization, or if they're not saved, could possess them, they manifest. You think that's wild and too much like the exorcist? Well, you don't know the Bible. You don't know anything about Jesus Christ. Believe me, I haven't asked for this kind of thing, not the ministry I would ever have chosen. But if you, (laughs) I'm telling you right now, if you bother to minister the truth, you're going to set off. When you allow the, the power of the Holy Spirit to enter a room where people are controlled by demonic powers to one degree or another, and you begin to shake it up and expose it for the purpose of delivering people and getting them saved, you're going to see a counter reaction. Some of you know what I'm talking about. I'm going to leave it there because that's too heavy for some people. But this is what I'm trying to say. God is not and was not ever playing a game when he said that we are sinners, okay? that we're born with a fallen human nature, and that our hearts are desperately wicked, who can know it? God is not playing games. Let's just extend this truth a little bit. If our sins are not paid for by the death of Jesus Christ, who paid the penalty for our sins, if we do not, by faith, put our faith and Christ's ability to forgive us of all of our sins through his blood, if we do not receive and put our faith in Jesus Christ coming into our lives and making us born again and becoming brand new creatures in Christ Jesus, then our sins are paid for. Then we have an inner nature that's redeemed. 
then we have the Holy Spirit inside us. But God said that if you reject God's free offer of salvation and forgiveness by putting your faith in Jesus Christ, God said that if you reject that, the penalty for sin is death. But it's deeper than that. The penalty for sin, the penalty for rejecting God's free offer of salvation, is that you stand before the great white throne of judgment, you discover your name is not written in the book of life, and you are sentenced into the lake of fire or hell for all eternity. Now, just do the math with me. That's a very heavy level of judge punishment. So, God is not evil. God is love. So, the reason that God would utter such a judgment, which is to sentence unbelievers, people who reject salvation for all eternity in a place called hell, tells you just how much, how evil we are in our fallen human nature, just how depraved we are, just how uh, abominable our hearts are. There's nothing good in us apart from Christ. See, the modern church doesn't want to touch this with a 10-foot pole of the gospel. It's the gospel. That's how serious this is with God. So all these ministers and these churches that try to gloss over the truth are, are not doing people any good. They're, they're preaching a false gospel. Now, the devil understands this. The devil understands this. So, God's people can be in one of two places. They can be in revival because they believe the Word of God and they're walking in truth and they're born again, or choose to walk in deception and accept this kind of everybody's good kind of false gospel. You go on one path or the other. But the devil is the temporary God of this world. Now, the devil. And many Christians, you know, they don't want to read Bible prophecy. They don't want to really know what's going on. They don't want to really uh, get down to the truth. But if you read Bible prophecy, it's very clear that the devil is leading a revolution against God with one-third of the fallen angels and all the people that are following Satan. And Christ is going to, at the second coming, with the armies of heaven, all the angels that are following him, and all the people that are following him, and there's going to be the war of Armageddon, where once and for all, God defeats Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet, and he becomes the King of Kings and Lord of Lords of planet Earth. That's where we're heading. But here's the key thing. God warned us over and over again in his word that in the last days, which we're in, there will be a great apostasy, a great falling away from the truth by people who are supposed to be Christians. God said in the last days, people would be given over to a great delusion. God said in the last days that there will be false Christs, false teachers, false prophets, doctrines of demons, false messiahs, spiritual deception is everywhere. So, we have to understand the nature of the spiritual battle. And it's a battle for the hearts and minds of mankind. And that the devil uses things like propaganda, scientific mind control, which stems from sorcery and ancient magic, control people's minds. And remember, people can be idealistic and uh, useful idiots, like the communist leaders say, and basically good in their hearts, but because they're not born again, you see, you have to look at reality properly, that the people who become the followers of these communist socialist movements who are not truly born again uh, are operating according to their fallen human nature. 
which is wicked, okay, desperately wicked, and therefore because they have no capacity to accurate spiritual discernment, they will end up following passionately antichrists, super evil dictators, mass murderers, despots. How, how do you think all these nice people, they start out being nice, like the Germans, how do you think all these nice people ended up uh, working with Adolf Hitler to kill seven to eight million both Jews and other people in the Holocaust? Spiritual deception. How do you think all these nice people followed Chairman Mao in mass slaughter of a hundred million people? How do you think all these nice people followed the communist revolution in Russia? Because they're 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 following a, f- a false messiah, an antichrist spirit, and they're being led by lies and propaganda and mind control. And the reason they're vulnerable to mind control, propaganda, lies, and spiritual deception is because they don't have the Holy Spirit, which is the spirit of truth in them. They're not born again, and they're not renewing their minds with the Word of God on a regular basis, which is why the church is filled with some people that have no spiritual discernment. Now, what can we do about it? We must educate people as fast as we can while the doors are open. We must spread truth far and wide. Once again, this program, there are people you know that need to hear this message, that need to talk about it. You need to send it to them to go around the censorship on the Internet. Go to paulmcguire.us and send the link of this program to people. Number two is... The more knowledge you acquire, the more you self-educate yourself, and the more you're willing to make yourself available to educate and give knowledge to others, the more you can spread truth, which sets people free, the more you can spread truth, which wins souls to Jesus Christ. But the more you you, uh, create uh, disciples, if you will, of people that cannot be deceived and pulled into these dark, satanic, revolutionary movements. that they, they, they operate like cults. They operate just like cults. So, I have resources for you at paulmcguire.us. Get the video documentary, American Mind Wars, The Coming Crisis Event. Go to paulmcguire.us, go to where the video section is, and you can download the brand new documentary, American Mind Wars, The Coming Crisis Event, and it will explain much of this to you in a fast-moving way. Plus, you can invite people over for coffee or whatever and discuss it. Instead of discussing trivia or trivial pursuits, this is meaty stuff, and it's spiritually based. So get yourself the download, American Mind Wars, The Coming Crisis Event. And then we have a package on these three books that will really help you because each book specializes in a different area of scientific mind control, sorcery, spiritual deception, brainwashing, hypnotic programming, how to be free from it, how to overcome it, how to combat it. You see, these are not all powerful things. You can overcome them. For example, there's no reason why 8 out of 10 kids from evangelical homes have to continually walk away from their faith in Christ. That's the national statistic by right now, currently. 8 out of 10 kids from evangelical homes walk away from their faith in Jesus Christ by the time they enter college. Why? Mind control, brainwashing, persuasion, social engineering. But you see, if you're knowledgeable about how that works, You can take some simple steps to undo that, and then they're not going to walk away from Christ. See, wisdom is far more powerful than, you know, exerting enormous energy and effort, and and you don't know what you're doing. So, I want to encourage you to get the video and share it with friends. American Minds, the coming crisis event. You can download it at paulmcguire.us. 
Get yourself a copy of Conquering the Matrix. It deals with all kinds of subjects. EMF, EMF frequencies, 5G frequencies, uh, programming, mind control, how to break it, how to recognize it, how to be free from it, and how to find out if you or somebody you love is under uh, mind control or hypnoprogramming to whatever degree. The book is called Conquering the Matrix. Then, a very necessary book is A Prophecy of the Future of America, where I talk about Illuminati music videos, where they came from, what the symbols are, how it originated. I trace it back to the 1947, when the CIA uh, secretly smuggled in 10,000 Nazi mind control scientists into America secretly under a secret operation called Operation Paperclip, which I described, I describe in a prophecy of the future of America. And they began secret experimentation at very prestigious laboratories and think tanks. These Nazis were given, Nazis were given unlimited monies, funds. They partnered with uh, Stanford Research the Research Institute, Palo Alto, many universities, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and the experimentation they began, which is creating Manchurian candidates, erasing personalities, uh, um, creating beta sex slaves. That, that was like kindergarten stuff in 1947. They have advanced beyond your wildest beliefs through all kinds of scientific mind control programs. And you can discover what they are, the history of them, and uh, find out how it's penetrated the music industry. I name the name of artists, what the purpose of the Illuminati music videos are, what the purpose of the occult and Illuminati imagery is in movies, and a lot more in A Prophecy of the Future of America. It's a mind blowing book. And then Mass Awakening. And Mass Awakening is about mass mind control. Adolf Hitler used mass mind control to to take ordinary, decent, hardworking Germans and turn them into Nazis. He mobilized a satanic Nazi army right out in the open, right in the face of the evangelical born-again church. Now think about this, really think about this for a moment. Adolf Hitler was widely recognized as being demon-possessed by his top leaders. The uh, Nazi party was first a a occult party and a political party second. It was a secret network of occult parties in Germany. I describe all of this in uh, Prophecy of America and uh, mass awakening. It was a secret network of occult parties like the Thule Society, the Nazi Party, the Vril Society that put Hitler into power. They used occult satanic technologies. They used occult satanic mind control and propaganda. And that was the demonic energy force that that caused a a satanic transformation in the hearts and minds of the German people to become these fervent Nazis who ended up slaughtering 8 million Jews and others in concentration camps. Now, the Christians should have known what was going on because the average German knew what the Vril Society was, the Thule Society, the Nazi party was. They knew about the occult part of it. The Christians knew about the occult part of it. The swastika was an ancient Tibetan occult symbol. People knew it was an occult symbol. The SS lightning bolts on the um, uh, soldiers, the high-ranking soldiers, um, were, were, was an occultic symbol. And then finally, if that's not obvious enough, the skull and bones, belt buckles, the, the skull and bones lapel pins, the skull and bones uh, uh, thing on the hats of the German officers and the SS troops, 
That is the symbol of death. And that is the symbol of the Skull and Bones secret occult society, which set up shop at Yale University in the 1800s. And President Bush Sr. and Jr. and John Kerry and many others are secret occult society Skull and Bones members. That's a symbol of death. And many say that one of the primary purposes in the mass slaughter of 8 million people was to conduct a mass satanic sacrifice. So why was it that the Christian church, the Christian pastors, and the Christian people were totally blind to what was happening? They were just as blind as the Jews. The Jews were blind to the reality of their demise, and they kept saying it can't happen here. But the Christians were so spiritually dead and so spiritually blind that they actually voted in legally Adolf Hitler to be the political head of Germany. The Christians voted him in. The Christian church was spiritually dead. They couldn't see the obvious. They had no spiritual discernment. I'm telling you right now, that is the condition spiritually of the vast majority of the so-called born-again evangelical church in America. They are just as spiritually blind and vulnerable to propaganda and lies as the evangelical church was in Nazi Germany. I'm telling you, not playing games. That's why I write the books, I do the documentaries, to warn and inform people. That's why you need to get... um, a three-book package of Conquering the Matrix, Mass Awakening, A Prophecy of the Future of America. You need to get the video documentary, uh, American Mind Wars, The Coming Crisis Event. And you need to join me at the next Paradise Mountain Church meeting, which is coming up Wednesday, January 30th. The meeting is free. Parking is free. But you need to pray. And then you obey God. If he tells you to come, stop making excuses. Obey God, come. We minister in the power of the Holy Spirit. I teach from God's word. I make myself available to pray for every single person who needs prayer. God moves in supernatural power. Everything is done decently in order. And it's centered on the teaching of the word. And God moves in a powerful way at these meetings. So I'd love to see you there. It's in Studio City. It's held at the Sportsman's Lodge. And the meeting is free. Parking's free. But you have to pre-register at paulmcguire.us. paulmcguire.us. If you decide to come, ask the Lord if you need to bring someone. People need to hear the truth. Or we're going to suffer uh, uh, unnecessarily in this nation. Because we're, we're we're at the tipping point right now. And if we will seek the face of God, and if we'll believe God, and if we'll repent, God is more than willing to supernaturally intervene in your own personal life, but God is also willing to supernaturally intervene in the lives of his people, in the lives of America, or people in any other nation who call upon him. And you see, if if that anointing of that hope is not on you, then you need to come to the meeting and receive the anointing of that hope and that truth upon you. Or if you can't come to the meeting, we have all the meetings posted up in broadcast television quality on our Roku channel. Um, Roku channel is called Paul McGuire Ministries. We have tons of new broadcast quality videos going up. Uh, Sign up for the Paul McGuire YouTube channel and and plug into our our broadcast quality video messages and and find yourself renewed and and under the anointing of the Holy Spirit because look there are two paths right now before every believer in Jesus Christ you can walk in the way of spiritual deception which is going to kind of tone everything down you're going to believe everybody's good you're going to be open for spiritual deception, and you're going to miss God's will for your life. 
or you can choose uh, to walk in the ways of the Lord. And that's determined by walking in the ways of his word. And then you are you will receive the anointing of the Lord, the blessing of the Lord, and the guidance of the Lord. The, the choice is yours. So thank you for listening. We're at a critical time right now. The burden in my heart is to reach as many people as possible, as fast as possible, with the message of truth. And you can help us by being a committed intercessory prayer warrior for me, my family, and this ministry. You can partner with us by doing an end run around the censorship of the internet and sending these messages out, spread them far and wide. And you can partner us financially um, by simply going to the Lord and asking the Lord without having your mind made up first. Just ask the Lord, Lord, what do you want me to do? How much do you want me to contribute or donate uh, to Paul McGuire Ministries and Paradise Mountain Church? And then simply obey the Lord. Whatever he tells you to do, do. That's the secret of blessing, not sitting out with your calculator and, and measuring pennies to make sure you hit the right percentage mark. You know, God loves a cheerful giver and a joyful giver. And the greatest secret of blessed life, financial blessing and otherwise, is, is it's not, look, if you're in the, as an accountant, I respect you. That's an important business. We need accountants because it's responsible fiscal management. But our relationship with God should not be through the lens of an accountant. Our relationship with God should be, God, everything you have, I mean, everything I have is yours. And so we give God everything, our hearts, our minds, our lives, and we put him first and we prioritize him. That doesn't mean we're trying, we have to live like Mother Teresa. No, we just put God first. And if we put God first, he'll show up in our lives. He'll bless us. He'll lead us and protect us. That doesn't mean we won't have spiritual battles. We will. But victory is from the Lord. God bless you. I'm Paul McGuire. Visit paulmcguire.us.